Um, so, uh, in this paper, I'm going to be talking about this extremely beautiful place, which is Swaddle Bay on the uh, north coast of the Arden American Peninsula on the west coast of Scotland. Um, but before I do that, I just thought, um, I thought, because it's a session about time, culture and identity, I'd, um, I suppose, give a little bit of personal perspective about uh, how, how this has sort of uh, influenced me. Um, so, uh, so I read Time, Culture and Identity about 15 years ago and uh, found it very exciting uh, as a way in for thinking about uh, uh, time, culture and identity in the, in, in, I, in the Mesolithic. That's what I'm very interested in, the British Mesolithic. Uh, and uh, for the Neolithic, there's lots of upstanding stuff, and uh, you can think about those in all sorts of exciting ways. Uh, but when it comes to, to thinking about time, culture, and identity in the Mesolithic, we're really this just mostly lithics, and so uh, it's how we think about those. And um, so I found this a really useful uh, way in uh, uh, for thinking about some key areas that uh, that uh, then this led me down the rabbit hole towards Heidegger and I should say that Julian was my doctoral supervisor as well uh, so between 2004 and 2008 I blissfully spent lots of time thinking about things like gathering the equipment totality and horizons of disclosure here is a quote from Heidegger about what the equipment totality is he says there's no such thing as an equipment to the being of any equipment there always belongs a totality of equipment equipment is essentially something in order to always is in terms of it belonging to other equipment inkstand paper blotting pad table lamp furniture windows doors room I, I, I really liked this idea and found it really useful to think about the multiplicity of material things that that would have existed in the Mesolithic but have maybe not necessarily been preserved at, at many sites uh, and I found it a really useful way of, of thinking of rethinking about time culture and identity in the the Mesolithic so on uh, this, this is really sad that I know the date on the 16th of December 2007 I handed in my PhD in the morning and I hot footed it to York on the train to York tag and I ran a session about phenomenology and how great phenomenology is and uh, Julian spoke in it uh, uh, Kenny Brophy Mark Jillings Oliver Harris various people spoke in the session and it was really nice at the same time in the rest of archaeological theory something else was happening and the stuff that I really enjoyed about these kind of approaches about how we think about ma material things and people and how these kind of relationships emerge uh, uh, was uh, people were t turning towards this elsewhere uh, um, in the ontological turn under the banner of assemblage and new materialist and relational approaches uh, and I've already used this slide once in tag so I'm sorry to be repetitive I'm going to use another one in a second that I've already used um, but um, so subsequently I found this is a really lovely way of sort of then think moving my thoughts in a really nice direction to move my thoughts again about material things and people and places and how they all emerge how they're always entwined and co continually emerge through their relationships with one another um, and so we've already heard the first fantastic paper talked about assemblages uh, and I, you've probably seen about a million papers that talk about <coughs> assemblages at TAG already but uh, just in case, just in case you haven't, uh, um, the crucial thing about uh, this kind of approach is that uh, things and people are uh, ontologically uh, equal, they're equally effective. So Rachel Crellin uh, exemplifies this really nicely, in a really nice, easy way to understand using the uh, uh, assemblage of a bus. Um, so she shows that a bus isn't just you know, the bus and the people, it's all the things on the pe on, uh, in the bus, the wheels and the engine and the oil and the tickets and the pu push chairs and the wheelchairs and the bodies and the clothes and the headphones and the metal of the bus and the windows and the adverts on the bus all of those things are the assemblage of a, a bus but as the bus moves that assemblage is that assemblage change people get on and off the bus uh, i like the idea that the uh, exhaust pipe might fall off the bus or something like that mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which case it might limp down the road a little bit so the crucial point of this though is that assemblages are always temporary and that any component can be part of different assemblages at any one time so that the the driver is the part of the assemblage of her, her family and, uh, and and things like that um, and so larger assemblages can emerge from the component parts of, of smaller ones uh, and as Oliver Harris has discussed 
Assemblages allow us to move between different scales, and we heard that earlier as well, uh, and their value for temporal scales is what I want to discuss in the rest of this paper. And um, so, obviously, uh, I, I've uh, pointed before to beautiful Ardermirk, and it means I've just put up lots of lovely pictures uh, and make it look like it's always sunny in Western Scotland. Um, so I uh, direct the Ardermirk and Transitions Project. We founded it in 2006, and I co-direct it with Oliver Harris from the University of Leicester and Phil Richardson from Archaeology Scotland. It's a multi-period landscape project, um, and uh, we've been looking at... At, at this amazingly preserved landscape which is in an incredibly isolated place and so no one else has really gone there and done anything to it in recent times which is wonderful and at the heart of what we've been doing is looking at a neolithic chamber tomb called clad Andrus, and that is terrible pronunciation i'm ever so sorry um, it's on the north coast of the Ardnamurkan Peninsula. And prior to our work on the peninsula, uh, they, the only thing that was really known was that there were some bits and bobs of lithics had been found and that there was three chamber tombs. And Cladane, this was the one that we were drawn to. For me, I was drawn there because um, in the early 2000s, there was this big narrative about, ooh, we think there's a whole load of chamber tombs in the west of Scotland that might uh, be on top of a shell midden and uh, a mesolithic shell midden. So that was my motivation for, for coming to this site. And when Audrey Henschel had surveyed this site in the 70s, she'd seen a rabbit hole with some shells coming out of it. So that was, uh, that's why we went there. Uh, and uh, sadly, there's, we've not found any mesolithic there. So there we go, but it's uh, still a really lovely, really exciting site. It's a Clyde-type cairn, but there wasn't really much information about it. It's a funny old shape, look. It's got this kind of weird dog leg. And here it is in real life, uh, superimposed onto a drone shot. So when I take this away, you'll be able to see the shape of it better. There you go, can you see that? So it works quite nicely. It looks weird in real life, but, uh, but when you do that, you can see that quite nicely. So this is the monument, and um, it's a scheduled ancient monument. So we've been constrained by uh, the permissions that we've had in terms of what we can tell you about it. We started outside the scheduled area at the front uh, in front of the, the chamber, in front of the facade, uh, and excavated that, and then slowly got scheduled monument consent to excavate quite a lot of the top of the monument. But the bottom end of it, um, we've only had permission to strip and map it. This is our trench stripping and mapping it. And so I'll explain what we know about the tomb in a minute, and you'll see that there's quite a lot of caveats because we've only stripped and mapped it, and we haven't done any intrusive excavation uh, there. So let me tell you about this fantastic uh, monument. It's great. Um, so it all started here uh, about 3700 BC, uh, where a small cremation was put in a hollow in the sand, and then uh, a, a kist was built around it. And subsequently, a chamber was built next to it, and a cairn of stones was built over it. And from the chamber, we've got a date of 3500 BC. And in the chamber, uh, rarely for Western Scotland, we found uh, human remains uh, uh, in bundles, little tight bundles of bits of bodies that must have been in bags uh, shoved into the, the chamber. Um, then what else have I said? Oh yes, and the chamber aligns with the setting sun. So it aligns with the setting sun in the West. It's very dramatic and lovely. So then what happened in the Neolithic? is harder to discern as a result of us not having excavated the tail. When we stripped and mapped it, we thought we'd just, it would just be really clear that it was all one big monument. But down here, it almost looks like we might have another cairn with possibly another uh, chamber in it. But this is all caveats. Until we've uh, had permission to excavate it, we, we can't say. Uh, what we can say is that in front of the tomb, in the late 3500, early 3400s, a ditch was dug. It doesn't extend anywhere around it, just at the front there. And that ditch is there. And then, uh, towards the end of the Neolithic, uh, the monument was closed. Oh, hang on a second. Oh, yes, cool. Uh, so the monument was closed uh, with an inhumation at the front of the chambers, uh, and, and that was the, the end of, of the use of the chambers. However, remember that weird dog leg? What's very exciting is that that dog leg is a Bronze Age curb cairn. Hooray! Right up abutted against the, the monument. Uh, and within the centre of it, there's a kist, uh, and uh, the, we've got a date from that of 1700 BC. And um, 
At the same time, we also found a kist when we were excavating this, just here as well, which um, looks very similar to the one in the um, in uh, this Bronze Age cairn that we excavated. Oh, and the curve is made of uh, all the black volcanic rock in the area. It's lovely. Um, and so we found this other kist, uh, but no uh, suggestion of any kind of structure associated with it, like cairn associated with it. And it looks like it's been robbed in antiquity. It was it was empty. Um, now, it, again, this is one of those caveats. There may perhaps be something else in here. It almost looked like there was a circular structure with a with a, a rectangle, a kist of stones, a rectangle of stones in the middle. But but we can't say anything without excavating that. But what we do know, we excavated up here and we found stones which abutted these stones. So we know that there's this first circular phase, the phasing of the rest of the, te the, the tomb. Basically, we can't really say much about until we until we've excavated it. Um, uh, there's stuff going on, but we can't say more than that at the moment. What we can say is that in the Iron Age, people came along and we cut that ditch at the front of the tomb. And they also had a hearth in between the kind of um, uh, chamber and, and the ditch as well. And then there's been subsequent me uh, post uh, uh, medieval and post medieval interventions as well. That's the yellow blobs. So um, the Viking boat burial, which we hit the media for finding, that's only about 100 metres down here, somewhere down on the floor. Um, so in the chamber, we found a Viking bead. Now, the relationship between uh, the Viking, the understanding the Viking activity in the chamber is unfortunately not possible because it was robbed uh, or certainly footled about with in the, uh, in the uh, Victorian period. And uh, as a result, the, any cut that might have been there that, that <coughs> linked to Viking activity has been cut by modern activity. There was also some kind of uh, odd cellular structure built almost right on top of the, uh, the Bronze Age cairn, which uh, I think is probably just a sheiling. It was very ephemeral. Uh, and then here, again, this is one of those where we can't be sure because we've, uh, we've overstripped a map, but it looks like they've used the topography uh, to create um, like a flue. So this may be a corn drying kiln, like a, a modern corn drying kiln. You can see, if I just whip those off again, there's a, there's a kind of circular gap this stuff goes down a hill and we, they look like there's uh, um, state, uh, post holes as well. So, so there's some really exciting things going on at Clad Angels. And so that's a really sort of uh, almost classic Holtorfian biography of this tomb, isn't it? I told you it in a, in a nice linear biography and that's really great. Except that it sort of suggests, like any biography, that it's had a use life and that now it's finished we've come along and done the autopsy on it and, and excavated this tomb. Um, and also in that account that I've given you of that tomb, it's a really anthropocentric account. I told you about the things that humans have done to the monument over time and how all the effects at the monument arise from human action. And I don't necessarily think that that's a helpful way of thinking about uh, Clad Angus uh, in, in this regard. Um, because uh, there's so much stuff going on here. This linear anthropocentric story just tells one part of the story. And, and, uh, and I think if we take an assemblage approach, we can think about the multiple assemblages here uh, and think about temporality at this site in, in a different way. Um, so various people have written uh, sort of from an assemblage perspectives about time and um, uh, I was really struck by, Gavin gave a talk about it at Manchester and gave an example of a handkerchief that you take a handkerchief and you fold it over nice and neatly, you have nice neat planes of time that meet each other, but you could scrumple that handkerchief and then all of the planes of that handkerchief meet each other in different complicated ways. And I think that that's a really nice analogy for thinking through Clad Angus in a different way. And when we think about it in that way, we can think about all sorts of other uh, material effects, and material relationships that, uh, that affect this tomb and affect what it is um, uh, and affect its temporality. So to finish the paper, I'm just going to pick three different things to, to talk through, which I think uh, uh, give us a, a completely different insight into to the temporality of this monument from something linear and anthropocentric. 
So, so the beads are a lovely example, aren't they? Really, a nice, really obvious way in. So we found these, did I say, um, yeah, I think I did, that we found these lovely beads. We found these lovely jet beads there, Whitby jets. We're on the west coast of Scotland. These have come from Whitby on the north, northeast of England. Uh, and these were in the curb can in the kiss, uh, and there was five of them. You can see from the macroscopic analysis that they've been worn. They've been on a spacer plate necklace. We didn't find that very sad. But that's an example of the kind of uh, necklace that this would have been on. So we found uh, these beads that would have been worn on a necklace like that. So if we take, if we think about the, there's multiple assemblages that are, that that bead has been in. We can think about the, and therefore multiple temporalities of it. So we can think about uh, geological time. That's, that was the, how it was formed, how the jet was formed in geological time. And then within human history, we can think about the, the temporality and the assemblages mm -hmm. of quarrying it or finding it on a beach, of transporting it across the country, of working it, uh, and then the time of wearing it when it was on a necklace like that and worn against bodies uh, uh, and curated uh, as a necklace. And then the time of dividing it up, that time when it was split, that necklace was split, when that bead itself uh, was already vibrant and pulsing with all sorts of different uh, um, uh, properties as a result of all the other temporalities and assemblages that have been part of uh, that have made it up in that necklace and then taking that pulsing vibrant bead and putting it uh, in the funerary context uh, is you know, uh, really thank you um, significantly um, uh, uh, affects that assemblage, uh, the, the properties of, of, of the assemblage of bead, body and kiss uh, uh, emerge through the various bringing together of different temporalities of the human life, of the uh, different stones that make up the kiss and of that bead itself, those beads, those little pulsing vibrant beads. So that's one really nice way of thinking about sort of multiple temporalities then uh, allow something so small to be so powerful. Next, the next thing I want to think about is something a little bit more abstract. It's sand. That's a nice stock picture off the internet. Um, so obviously, sand also encompasses geological time. But I'm thinking more specifically about the sand here. When we when we dug the ditch in 2007 and 2008, and then it rained, uh, sand poured out of the sides of the trench. And uh, if you remember, the tomb is built on the sand. It's built on the raised beach. So the sand poured out the sides of the trench and down into the ditch itself. Um, and I think that this is the, this is like the scrumpling of the hanky right here, because uh, something that existed even before the tomb was constructed met the present day. And more than that, it poured through the Neolithic ditch and the Iron Age recut. And in the Neolithic and the Iron Age, this would probably have occurred too, and people would have had to have cleared it out. And so in this sense, uh, the sand um, throws aside any linear narrative, providing an assemblage where the, the range of different temporalities are, are scrumpled and all meet just like the, the hanky. And finally, the fi final element of this assemblage I want to think about is students. Um, this is a very contemporary assemblage and something that me and Karina Croucher have been working on uh, uh, elsewhere uh, and published on elsewhere. Um, but thinking about the students who came and trained on these excavations, their training excavations, these students bring different temporalities with them too. Their own life ages, but their families, their uh, world views all come and converged or came and converged at Cladendris. Um, and all of those uh, assemblages that they come from are effective in the assemblage of Clad Angels because these students are part of the team, they're part of the digging and interpreting team, and they bring all those things from elsewhere. And uh, what's crucial is that then they go off again, off into other assemblages, and they take this with them, the temporalities of, of Clad Angels with them, and the experiences and the physical stuff, the mud on their boots, which is going to you know, get on their floor and go between their toes when they're wearing bare feet and how annoying that will be. So Clad Angels uh, and the temporalities of it extend out through the students that, uh, that come to this site. So it's a very quick rushed example uh, and this is the start of some thinking that we're doing really. Um, uh, and, but I think hopefully I've shown that thinking about this monument uh, 
through the temporality of it through assemblages is really useful. It allows us to shift from a linear temporal narrative uh, and it allows us to think about how all these multiple material components of the assemblages of Clad Angus converged and converged to make it and to make people over time. Um, and therefore, it's really great to consider the site as one that's dynamic and vibrant and one that's still in progress. And that means that hopefully I'll be able to think lots more about lots more assemblages. But for now, I'm going to finish. So thank you very much. Thank you.